all right good morning so we've had a long gap because of the gandhi jayanti but uh so before we had our long break we had covered um the book of job so we started off the poetic books uh so we started with job we have talked about that uh, so today we will try to cover the rest of the poetic books that would be basically from psalms all the way up to song of solomon so the goal is to uh, try and cover uh, these four books today uh, before we get into the class as such um just to you know um uh, tell you that hopefully by thursday or friday i will put the um, midterm assessment in google uh, so it will be a multiple choice uh, paper so you would have 50 questions um so you just have to tick the correct answer and you will probably have around um, two or three weeks to complete it so you know i mean you can take your time it really doesn't matter to me how long you take as long as you finish it before this course gets over you know so um so it would be a google uh, question paper which is um, multiple choice so there would be 50 hmm? there would be 50 multiple choice questions so uh, you would have to tick the correct answer so um 70% of those questions will be what we have covered in the class about 30% you may have to look for the information uh, online so the idea is that this will be like a revision uh, it will be it will help you to remember recollect all the things that we have covered in case you do not know the answers uh, it will give you a chance to go back to the videos and look for the information in the videos so this is basically a revision exercise all right so um um and um i mean you can take 3 weeks even 4 weeks it really doesn't matter uh, but the point is uh, if you can attempt all of those 50 questions and it's just multiple choice so you just have to click the right answer so um even for those who will be uh, you know doing this question paper on the e platform uh, it will be posted so the goal is to post it by thursday or friday at the latest at the latest uh, so uh, definitely by this weekend uh, you know uh, your google question paper will be in place online all right so just kind of make sure that you go and check it uh, at the end of this week and um, so i have not yet decided which from genesis from from the introduction up to which book uh we would have it it will be clearly mentioned over there in the question uh, paper so uh that should not be a problem all right yeah uh so for those of you who have posted over here in the chat uh like i said it's going to be a google uh, question paper which is basically a multiple choice uh paper so you just have to tick the correct answer all right so all right uh, let's get started with the book of psalms uh, so we covered one poetic book last time uh, which was the book of job so this time we would be looking at the uh, next four poetic books um so the book of psalms uh, did someone ask a question okay uh, yeah uh, so the book of psalms we generally uh, think about david when we think of the psalms but then there were multiple writers it was not only david who wrote some of the psalms we also have other people writing the psalms so um, there are 73 psalms uh, for which the title is given as psalm of david so most probably it was those 73 psalms that david wrote but apart from that you had other people also writing the psalms uh, you have psalms of asaph you have the psalms of kora um there are three psalms which have been written by king solomon so he too has written three of the psalms you have one psalm written by uh, somebody named ethan 
and finally you have a psalm written even by moses uh, that would be psalm 90 uh, so so because these psalms have been written by different people it covers different time periods so moses probably wrote the earliest psalm uh, you know because he lived around uh, around 1400 bc so uh, he wrote psalm 90 and then um, uh, many psalms were written during the time of king david and then later during the post exilic period also you have a few psalms being written so you could say that the psalms actually covers almost 900 years you know so that was the time span during which all of these psalms were uh, written now when the um, israelite people they compiled the psalms together uh, you know into one uh, into one book they actually wrote it out on five different scrolls so the psalms are um, divided into five sections uh, and you know most of our bibles they will actually give you the section they will say you know section 1 and then you'll have the list of psalms and then you'll have section 2 so um, section 1 is basically uh, you know uh, psalm 1 up to psalm 41 and then section 2 will be uh, chapters 42 to 72 and then you have section 3 which will be chapters 73 to 89 uh, section 4 includes uh, chapters 90 up to 106 and finally the last section begins with psalm 107 so that goes on all the way up to Psalm 150. So um, when they compiled the psalms, they wrote them out on five separate scrolls, and so you basically say, uh, you know, uh, we say that uh, the psalms are divided into five books or five scrolls or sections. Um, now, when we are looking at the psalms, we see that there are basically four kinds of psalms. Um, the most popular are the messianic psalms these are the psalms which talk about uh, the coming messiah just from you know off the top of your head would any of you know at least one messianic psalm can you name a messianic psalm those of you online if you can post you know if at least an example of one psalm which talks about the messiah the most popular one is actually psalm 22 which talks in great detail about the experiences that jesus goes through at the time of the cross it talks about how his clothing will be uh, you know divided among the people by casting lots it talks about how he will be so thirsty that the uh, that his tongue sticks to the roof of his mouth uh, it talks about how um, you know he would be um, you know uh, commented upon how people would you know uh, criticize him it talks about all those all those details are given in psalm 22 in fact psalm 22 starts off with a wording my god my god why have you forsaken me you know the very words which jesus speaks so psalm 22 is one of the most popular messianic psalms psalm 2 is also quite popular very well known that too talks about the messiah and then of course you have many other messianic psalms these are the psalms which talk about uh, the uh, messiah so yes we have someone here mentioning psalm 2 um we also have psalm 91 being mentioned by someone um oh psalm 91 a messianic psalm probably i would have to look it up i have no idea at the moment um yeah so the first category are the messianic psalms you also have something called the pilgrim psalms now these were psalms which the people would sing during their travel to jerusalem for the annual feasts the three most important feasts for the israelites uh, were the passover of course then you have the feast of pentecost you also have the feast of tabernacles so people would travel from all over the nation and even from outside the nation to jerusalem for these three feasts and as the people are traveling along they would sing these psalms so that is basically your psalm 120 up to psalm 134 they are called the pilgrim psalms because the people would come on a pilgrimage 
to offer their sacrifices to God. Uh, so um, at least three times a year they would come to Jerusalem. And during that time, these psalms were sung. Another popular um, type of psalm uh, is what you call the acrostic psalms. Now these are psalms which were arranged alphabetically you know, according to their alphabet, not according to the English alphabet, but no, according to the Hebrew alphabet. So the first alphabet in their language uh, was the, you know, alphabet Aleph, you know, the, the sound A. Ah. So uh, the, so you, you would have some certain Psalms, you know, the first verse will be written with the, starting with the alphabet A, uh, which is Aleph. Then you would have the second one, B, Beit. You know, so the second verse would start with the alphabet B. Uh, and then you have the third one. Th the third uh, alphabet for them in their language is Gimel. So, you know, uh, with G, with the sound G, the third uh, verse will begin. So in that way, they had acrostic psalms. There are many, many acrostic psalms. Psalm 9, Psalm 10, Psalm 25, Psalm 34. But the most well-known acrostic psalm, would you be familiar with that? anyone knows they can post over here online um, or here in the class if anyone knows the most popular acrostic psalm which was written alphabetically that actually would be your psalm 119 you know psalm 119 um, i think it has 176 verses uh, right so um, so that is divided into many sections psalm 119 is divided into many sections. The first section would be verses 1 to 8. So the first eight verses, they all begin with the alphabet Aleph. You know, they begin with A. Uh. Then you have the next uh, uh, verses 9 to 16. They all begin with B. Uh. You know, so in that way, um, right up to the last alphabet in their language, which would be Tau. Okay, so the last section of the, that would, all the verses in the last section begin with the uh, alphabet T. Okay, so uh, these are acrostic psalms. Why did the psalmist write this kind of a psalm? Basically because in those days, the people would memorize the psalms and they would sing them. So when you have it in an alphabetical order, it's easier to buy heart. It's easier to remember the psalms. And that is basically why the... Uh, psalms were written in this uh, alphabetical manner. Now there is another, yeah, like someone has, um, um, you know, mentioned over here, Psalm 119, yeah, it's, it's the most well-known, popular, acrostic psalm. The fourth kind of psalm, which has generated a lot of debate, is the, uh, is what they call the imprecatory psalms. These are basically psalms in which the psalmist cries out to God, to take vengeance. Uh, so um, the word imprecation basically is talking about curses. So the psalmist cries out to God and say, Lord, bring down judgment, bring down your curses upon these enemies of ours. So those are the imprecatory psalms. And so the debate basically is, should we in the New Testament times read psalms like that where the psalmist is crying out, you know, uh, for uh, judgment. Shouldn't we be very forgiving? Because, uh, you know, Jesus taught us to love one another. We are supposed to love our enemies. So is it really correct for us to be reading imprecatory Psalms today? You know, it's the, it's the question which is generally asked. Uh, but if you notice in the imprecatory Psalms, you will notice that these Psalmists are not speaking against somebody Due to personal reasons, all the imprecatory psalms that we find in the psalms, they all are talking about enemies who have done something to dishonor God. And so the psalmist is saying, Lord, these people have dishonored your name. So therefore, O God, bring judgment upon them. Or, you know, in some of the imprecatory psalms, the psalmist says, Lord, look at the way the wicked are oppressing the poor. Look at the injustice that is being done. Therefore, O oh God, in your righteousness, bring judgment upon them. So the imprecatory psalms are not just people randomly speaking curses upon someone whom they don't like. 
that is not what the imprecatory psalms are about the imprecatory psalms are clearly meant for one purpose where the psalmist has the same heart which god has he is angered when he sees the injustice which is being done he is angered when he sees people mocking the name of the living god and so expressing the heart of god this psalmist writes the psalm and cries out and says lord because your name is being dishonored because injustice is being celebrated therefore o oh lord you bring judgment upon these people so in that sense imprecatory psalms are expressing the heart of god against wickedness these are not just psalms where the psalmist is bringing curses upon people so yes even in the old testament times and in the new testament times we are not supposed to uh, hate our enemies so if somebody is being persecuted we cannot speak an imprecatory psalm against them you know um, all we can say is lord in your time if it is possible for this person to repent may they come to you and may they repent on the other hand if they have hardened their heart like the pharisees and there is no turning back for them then oh lord in your time let judgment come upon them so we adopt the same attitude which the psalmists did in the old testament time we do not speak curses upon people who are uh, harming us we do not speak curses upon those who are persecuting us rather just like the psalmists we say lord your name is being dishonored your kingdom purposes are being uh, you know harmed by these people so oh lord if you could bring them into your kingdom if you could help them to repent that would be perfect on the other hand if they have made up their minds that they are going to stand against the living god then lord in your time may judgment come upon them so we adopt that kind of an attitude we are not permitted to ever speak curses upon people um this one um point which some people raise they say paul in his epistles he spoke curses against people so they say in that sense he also spoke imprecatory words against the uh, enemies of god but that is not really true let's look at one example you know one imprecatory verse which they say that paul has spoken out against the enemies of god uh, but actually that is not true let's look at the wording that is used over there um galatians 1 8 to 9 if someone somebody could read out for us you know either online or here in the class if someone could read out for us galatians 1 verses 8 and 9 please galatians 1 8 and 9 but even if we are an angel from heaven should preach you preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you let him be accursed as we have said before so now i say again if any was is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received i let him be accursed the wording that paul uses over here regarding the enemies of the gospel you know the ones who are preaching a false gospel and uh, uh, and drawing people away from the kingdom of god he says let such people be accursed the term over there accursed is talking about let them come under god's curse which is why in the niv you know it clearly uh, it tries to translate that word accursed in that way it says let these people come under god's curse so it's not apostle paul who is speaking a curse upon them it is he's all he's saying is let these people come under god's curse under god's judgment so even apostle paul he never teaches that we are supposed to curse our enemies in fact he says in romans 12 19 to 20 that this should be our attitude towards our enemies so if you could have someone read out for us romans 12 verses 19 to 20 beloved never avenge your slaves mm. but leave it to the wrath of god for it is written vengeance is mine i will repay says the lord to the contrary if your enemy is hungry feed him if he is thirsty give him something to drink for by so doing will he burning 
falls on his head so all that paul says is you know when enemies ill treat you either due to personal reasons or for the sake of the gospel when enemies ill treat you when they persecute you it says leave room for god's wrath let god decide how he wants to deal with the situation and so uh, he he quotes from the old testament and he says the lord has said it is mine to avenge i will repay so let the lord repay what has been done on the other hand what should we be doing we should feed the enemy if he is hungry if he is thirsty we should give him drink and it says he says in the last portion you know in, in romans chapter 12 verse 20 he says in doing this you will heap burning coals on his head what does that mean it you know that that's basically a kind of um, figure of speech that was used in those days to heap burning coals on someone's head now those coals can be something which give warmth so if that person uh, you know has a repents and turns to god the coals will be they will warm him they'll be a blessing to him on the other hand if that person does not repent and turn to god those coals will be like an act of judgment and they will burn him okay so uh, that term let heaps of uh, let, let it let coals be heaped upon someone's head when you say that you're, you're talking about the coals in two senses you know um uh, in the in the in that middle eastern region the nights are extremely cold the daytime is very very hot but the night time is extremely cold so at that time they would use burning coals to warm themselves you know they would heap up a pile of burning coals uh, on a, on a, on a, on a metal uh, you know container and keep it very close to where they are sleeping so that the warmth from the coal will warm them during the night so the he, the the coals which are heaped upon the head it can either symbolize a person who has turned to god and now he's experiencing the warmth and favor of god or if that person continues to live in rebellion against god those burning coals will rather become a act of judgment rather than providing warmth and uh, you know uh, help to the person so paul is saying leave it in god's hands the lord will decide how to deal with those who are persecuting us all right so um another thing that you know maybe we can mention even as we are talking about this imprecatory psalms um maybe we should first begin by looking at what jesus has said uh you know a figure of speech which jesus uses um so if we could have somebody read out for us luke chapter 19 verses 41 um and maybe verse 44 luke 19 uh, verse 41 and verse 44 but he said to them how can this say- no i don't think so unless i have written it down wrong luke 19 uh, verse 41 and also verse 44 sorry ma'am and when he drew near and saw the city he wept over it verse 44, 44. 44 and tear down tear you down to the ground you and your children within you and they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation all right i am not sure which version you know um, this brother read out from uh, but you know generally in our niv nkjv the wording that is used over there is um, you know this is basically jesus speaking is he's looking at jerusalem and he weeps and he says judgment is going to come upon you and this is the wording that jesus uses in verse 44 he says they will dash you to the ground you and the children within your walls in many places in the old testament you have this term terminology where it talks about how the enemies will dash the people to the ground um that is a figure of speech which is talking about judgment so jesus is not saying that you know some the enemy is going to come and pick up each person and dash them to the ground it's not talking about any violent deed like that it's just a figure of speech which is saying that judgment will come upon you so in the imprecatory psalms you know when the psalmist uses that kind of wording in psalm 137 
He's not saying something bloodthirsty. He's not saying something that is terribly violent. He's just saying, let, let judgment come upon you. Uh, that would be Psalm 137 verses 8 to 9. This is basically the wording that is generally quoted when people talk about imprecatory psalms. And they say, my, look at the hatred which is mentioned in these verses. But actually, no, it's just a figure of speech which is being used. Uh, maybe we can have someone read out. Uh, Psalm 137 is talking about the judgment. The psalmist is asking God to bring judgment upon Babylon because the people have been taken away as exiles. And so the psalmist is crying out and saying, Lord, we are sitting by the rivers of Babylon and we are weeping because, you know, we have, uh, we have been taken away from our homeland. And the person cries out and says, Lord, please bring judgment upon uh, Babylon. And this is the wording which we find in verses 8 and 9. So if someone could read out for us Psalm 137, verses 8 and 9. O daughter of Babylon, doomed to be destroyed, blessed shall he be who repays you with what you have done to us. Blessed shall he be who takes your little ones and dashes them against the rock. The wording over here, it says, I know, blessed is the one who seizes your infants and dashes them against the rocks. And they say, my, what terrible wording. Imagine someone taking babies and dashing them against the rocks. It's not talking about any violent imagery like that. It's just a figure of speech which impl Im implies divine judgment. You know, we also use wordings like that in our uh, modern society. And nobody thinks of it as something um, bloodthirsty. For instance, you know, you have students who say, oh, that teacher, she likes to torture her students. Now, it's not talking about someone who, you know, it's not talking about a teacher who will actually tie the student to a chair and torture them. What, is, what do the students mean when they say the teacher, you know, she likes to torture the students? Maybe they're talking about the heavy workload. Maybe they're talking about many assignments. Maybe you people are thinking that right now because I said 50 questions. So it's just a term that you use where you say, oh, he's, you know, he likes to torture us. It doesn't mean that someone is going to actually literally torture. It's just a figure of speech talking about the hardship which is being imposed. In the same way, whenever the term being dashed to the rocks or being dashed to the ground, like Jesus said, when those wordings are used, it's just a figure of speech, uh, which is talking about divine judgment being brought upon people. So uh, it is important for us to understand the imprecatory psalms in the correct sense. We should not misinterpret them, all right? Um, so talking about the different figures of speech which are generally used in the psalms. In the psalms, you have a lot of um, metaphors being used. What are metaphors? Metaphors are basically a picture which you use to describe something. For instance, the psalmist says, Lord, you are my rock. He's not saying that God is literally a rock. He's saying, Lord, you are like a rock. So, you know, words like that. You have a lot of metaphors being used in the psalms. Uh, let's look at one particular verse, which in fact has got one, two, three, four, five. There are six metaphors in that one single verse. Uh, that would basically be a Psalm 18 verse 2. So maybe we can have someone read out for us Psalm 18 verses 1 and 2. Psalm 18 verses 1 and 2. Psalm 1818, Psalm 18, verses 1 and 2. Uh, maybe someone online can read out. I mean, if, if nobody over here is um, able to read, doesn't matter. I mean, if someone, someone at all could read because, you know, we are kind of running out of time. Psalm 18, verse 1 and 2. I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rogue and my fortress and my deliverer. My God, my rogue, in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. Okay, the look at the number of metaphors which are used to, to describe God 
in this verse he's talked about in the first portion as lord is my rock then it says my fortress and then another different word for rock is used you know um, and some uh, bibles will translate that as strength rather than rock but the actual word over there is rock then it also talks about him as a shield it talks about him as a horn and it talks about him as a strong hold these are all different metaphors being used to describe god and people who would have heard these words at that time would have understood what these words mean to us it sounds very doesn't sound very um familiar because we don't use that terminology now so if somebody says a rock i'll probably actually think of one big large rock but that is not the actual word that hebrew word that is used over there when he says the lord is my rock is basically saying the lord is my sela that word sela basically is talking about um it's like um it's like a opening in a mountain let's you know um in the mountain there is a small narrow passage way so on one side you have steep rock on the other side again you have steep rock in between there is a small narrow passage and that word sela is actually talking about that kind of a rock why is david saying lord you are that kind of a rock because you see when david was running from saul and he was hiding here and there he would basically hide in such places in the desert so he would try to go to the top of some you know uh, uh, rocky uh, terrain and hide over there and the opening to the top portion is only through a narrow passage so if saul sends his soldiers before the soldiers can come to the top he'll be able to see them because there's only one narrow passage so that word sela is talking about that kind of a cliff where it's very steep and you just have one small narrow passage going up so the person who's hiding on top will be able to see the enemy before the enemy goes and catches them so he says lord you are that kind of a rock to me so you see it's a word it's it's a it's a word picture which he is using and people in the in those terms would have understood what a sela is for us you know it's it's a new term so we will not understand what that means he uses one more uh, you know um, uh, expression in the in the next sentence where he says my god my rock uh, the you know the the version which the brother read out just now he actually uses the word rock so this is a different word for rock here the word is something called sur this is a different word and this word is talking about a a a, a mountain which is of very great height okay so sur is a kind of uh, is a kind of rock formation which is very very high so he's saying lord you are that kind of a rock and so some um, bibles will translate that as my god my strength because um that word sur is used for a high rock and that word is also used as uh, for strength because someone who is standing on top of that kind of a rock formation will be able to fight will be able to shoot his arrows from a position of strength so these are all word pictures which we don't understand because we have uh, we we belong to a different culture and so many thousands of years have passed by and we don't understand these word pictures today but that time when he wrote these words people would have understood what he is saying when he said lord you are my sela lord you are my tsur they would have understood what he is saying um in the same way uh, you know he uh, there are many places where uh, the psalmist he says lord you are my fortress the word that is used over there for fortress there are two different words because if you see in the, in the ending is one more word stronghold that also is a different kind of fortress for the first one in psalm 18 verse 2 where he says the lord is my rock and my fortress that term over there that's something called matsud matsud is basically not just a normal fortress this is a fortress which is built on a high mountain um in um, in the israelite region in the desert region there's something called the matsada it's a high uh, mountain on top of that matsada there's a fortress which was built 
you know, we we're not sure in which century it was built. We don't know whether the, that fortress was already existing in the time of David or not. But that is the word that is used, Matsud or Matsada. So he says, Lord, you are like that. You're so high up, oh Lord, that if I hide myself in you, nothing can touch me. The enemy may try as much as they want to destroy me. But Lord, you are like that Matsud. You are high above and I'm hiding in that fortress. I'm hiding in you and no harm will come to me, O Lord. So it kind of helps when we are you know, looking at the Psalms to also have a good commentary with us, which can give us the meaning of these words. It brings out the beauty of what the Psalmist is trying to say about the character of God. You know, so um, um, that can be um, uh, one uh, one takeaway from the Psalms. A lot of word pictures with a lot of meaning in them. Uh, so if we have a good commentary, that will help us to understand these terms much better. All right. Um, as we do not have much time, let's quickly go into the Proverbs. Um, proverbs also were written by multiple people. Yes, it is true that most of the Proverbs were written by Solomon. But we also have Proverbs being written by Lemuel and Agur. So in fact, the last section of Proverbs, that is written by Lemuel and Agur. So you basically have three different writers writing the Proverbs. Um, we can divide the book of uh, Proverbs into three main sections. Chapters 1 to 9 basically give a lot of advice to young people. Chapters 1 to 9 is mainly focusing upon advice that is being given to young people. Uh, maybe we can read out one proverb, uh, proverb 1.8. If someone can read out, proverb 1.8. Uh, you know, as we are really running out of time, if we could have people read. Hear my son, your father's instruction, and forsake not your mother's teaching. All right, so here the young person is being advised to pay attention to the instructions being given by the father, to not forsake the uh, the laws, the, the advice being given by the mother, to respect the, the instructions of both the parents. You know, so in that way, you have a lot of advice being given in chapters 1 to 9. Chapters 10 to 24 is mainly a collection of contrasts between the wicked and the righteous. And it talks about different topics. I mean, it talks about um, um, uh, working hard. It talks about honesty. It talks about, uh, you know, maintaining um, correct kind of balances in the marketplace. It talks about different things. Uh, but the main emphasis is, is on the contrast between the righteous and the wicked. Maybe one example that we can look at, uh, Proverbs chapter 10, verse 3. The Lord does not let but the craving of the wicked. Here it contrasts the righteous and the wicked, and it says, The Lord will take care of the righteous person, He will provide for him. But as for the wicked, you know, whatever they want, they may receive it or they may not, because the Lord will not, you know, help him. The Lord will not be there to support him. So, um, chapters 10 to 24 mainly draw a contrast between the righteous and the wicked and they cover many topics like honesty in the marketplace, hard work, um, um, uh, poverty um, and all of that. Um, chapters 25 to 31, the last section, basically gives instructions to leaders on how to lead. So, you know, most of you are going to be leading in ministry. Uh, you'll be leading organizations, you'll be leading in the church, uh, you know, you'll be serving in different capacities as leaders. So chapters 25 to 30, 31 basically are providing wisdom and advice to leaders. And there's something good which is said in um, Proverbs 25 verse 1. If someone could, could read out Proverbs 25. These also are Proverbs of Solomon, 
which the men of Hezekiah, king of Judah, copied. All right. So here we get to know that the Hezekiah asked his people to make many, many copies of these particular proverbs. Why? Because he wanted to be a good godly leader and he wanted his officers also to be good godly leaders. So in fact, he has he hires people to make copies of these particular proverbs and he probably you know, distributes it among them so that people will read these things, meditate upon these instructions and learn to be good godly leaders. It shows that Hezekiah had a heart to be a leader who will please the Lord. You know, rather than just being a worldly kind of leader, he had this heart's desire to be a godly kind of a leader. So he takes the effort to actually make copies of these proverbs. So we see that the proverbs are divided into three sections. Um, okay, even as we have about maybe eight or nine minutes left, maybe we can look at um, two proverbs which are trying to say the same thing but using different words. Uh, if we can first read out Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. All right, so here it says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Now let's look at another prop, Proverbs 9, 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the Holy One is in sight. Okay, so in Proverbs 1, 7, it says fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And in Proverbs 9, 10, it says fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Two different terms are used. When you fear the Lord, when you're living in a way that honors Him, two things. First, you get knowledge. Next, you also get wisdom. The word that is used for wisdom is the Hebrew word chokma. That word chokma is it talks, it's talking about very practical wisdom. You know, when we think of the word wisdom, we think of some, some deep, mysterious philosophy. It's not talking about that kind of a wisdom. When you have fear of the Lord and when, when you're living in a way that honors Him, you get a very practical kind of wisdom which is called chokma. What exactly is this Hebrew word chokma? It is basically the ability to live well and the ability to, to do everything well. It's, it's that simple. You know, when you're living with the fear of the Lord in a way that honors the Lord, the Lord imparts to you this kind of a kokma. You're able to live well and you're able to do everything well. That is, you will, he will show you to, how to make the right choices so that you can live well. You will be able to separate the good from the bad and be able to make the correct kind of choices for your life, for your future, so that you will be able to live well. And he will also see to it that everything that you put your hands to, it will prosper. You will be able to do everything well. So the, to have a fear of the Lord, to respect him, to honor and obey him, it leads to this very, very practical kind of wisdom which God will give you. He will grant you chokma. That word basically is talking about how you will start becoming a person who is able to live well because you are able to make all the right choices. He guides you. That fear for God which you have in your heart, that will enable you to make the correct choices for your life. And everything that you do, you will be able to do it well because He will bless the work of your hands. And um, so the fear of the Lord, honoring God, that is the beginning of this kokma. You know, people today, they are desperate for this kind of a wisdom. You have all kinds of, you know, courses which are offered online. If you want to, if you want to develop your software skills, attend this course, it says. You know, if you want to, um, to make the uh, right life choices, you know, uh, undergo this, uh, go to this particular conference. People are desperate to have this kind of a kokma, this kind of a wisdom. And it's given to us free by the Lord if we walk in fear of the Lord and honor Him and respect Him. 
the other term that is used that would be in uh, proverbs 17 there it says the fear of the lord is the beginning of knowledge this word knowledge that's the hebrew word da'at now this word is talking about how when you live in fear of the lord you will have an experiential knowledge of god that is not just a head knowledge of god but a very um, personal intimate relationship with him so fear of the lord leads to kokma fear of the lord also leads to an intimate personal knowledge of the lord that is you know through the different seasons of life where the good things are happening to you or where the bad things are happening to you you have decided i will honor the lord i will fear him i will continue to follow him even if there are going to be hardships and as you're walking with that attitude you start getting to know him personally you start discovering what kind of a faithful god he is you start experiencing him in a very personal way so now you don't just know the lord in a intellectual way you know him experientially there's an intimate relationship that is developing between him and you so the fear of the lord basically grants us two things we develop the ability to live well to do everything well which is basically kokma wisdom we also develop an experiential knowledge of the lord uh we have maybe about 3 minutes but i really want to you know give one example you know in uh, sunday school we have these children who come up in the front and they uh, you know they quote the bible verses they have learned they have memorized the bible verses by heart and they're standing over there and they are uh, you know quoting all those memory verses by heart out of memory and a person who is sitting in the you know congregation may let us say an old elderly person he knows those verses in a different way than the child who is quoting it from the stage the child is quoting it from the stage for them those verses are still head knowledge they just know the verses but they haven't experienced those verses in their life they have not gone through those trials and those difficulties and seen his faithfulness seen the wisdom of god you know uh, they have not seen the outworking of obedience there's so much that they don't know they have intellectual knowledge of the lord but they have not yet grown much in the lord but a person who's walked with the lord for many many years he doesn't just have an intellectual knowledge of those verses because he has actually lived out those verses you see he has obeyed the lord he has trusted him he has submitted to him his knowledge of the verses is very experiential deeper knowledge which is not just head knowledge but something that he has actually gone through so he knows the lord in a deeper way so the fear of the lord can give us that kind of a da'at the word knowledge which is used over there it refers to that okay so um i thought maybe we could just very briefly reflect upon these two verses which talk about the fear of the lord providing us with wisdom and also um knowledge uh well okay we only have 2 minutes left not much that can be done in 2 minutes uh so yeah maybe we can just take an early break uh so after we come back uh we will look very briefly at ecclesiastes and also the song of solomon all right yeah thank you <laughs> 